Um, this meeting is now called to order. We are going to have the vote on intro 376B. Um, good, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. Today before our joint oversight hearing with juvenile justice, the Committee on Youth Services will be holding a vote on intro number 376B. This bill was previously heard on April 26, 2018 by the Committee on Youth Services in order to receive valuable feedback from providers, advocates, and youth. After amending the bill, we believe that this piece of legislation will serve an important function in helping bullied youth get the resources and services they truly need. Intro number 376B, which was introed by Council Member Richie Torres, is a local law in relation to educational outreach and materials regarding bullying prevention, awareness, and resources. This bill would require DYCD to conduct outreach informing as many youth as practicable about the availability of bullying awareness and prevention resources, including those that provide counseling, mental health resources, mobile texting, or internet chat functional functionality and referrals. This outreach is so crucial and vitally needed that many youth are left disconnected and unaware that help that they could receive is available. Outreach, out, outreach would include DYCD disseminating resource materials through existing DYCD programs, as well as posting information on DYCD's website and on other city agencies' websites. In addition, the bill would require that DOE is to give students information regarding any existing online portal that is operated by DOE through which students or parents can report bullying, harassment, intimidation, or discrimination. It is blatant that New York City strives to be a city where no kid is bullied Though we have a ways to go to make this a reality, intro 376B is a step in the right direction. And I urge my fellow council members to vote yes on this bill, and we will begin the vote now. Matthew DiStefano, Committee Clerk, Committee on Youth Services. Roll call on intro number 376B. Chair Rose. Aye. Chin. King. Goodbye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the bill has been adopted. Thank you. We will keep the um, vote open um, for about 20 minutes for um, the other members to come and vote. And I now turn this over to Council Member Chair King. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Andy King, Chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee. Today we're having an oversight hearing. We held jointly with Council Member Debbie Rose, who is the Chair of the Committee of Youth and Services. We will be examining the city's reentry programs for formerly incarcerated and justice involved youth. I want to thank everyone who is here today from the administration, as more importantly, our council members who are here today. We are joined by Council Member Holden, Council Member Williams, Council Member Chen, Council Member Rose, and Council Member King. One substantial challenge faced by those operating our juvenile justice system is how to best ensure that young people are provided with the services and support necessary to avoid the reoccurrence of antisocial and unlawful behavior upon their release from detention and reentry back into society. Because juveniles are so often vulnerable to stress and peer pressure, and unless they are equipped with adequate and support network, it is relatively easy for them to lapse back into the same old habits that resulted in their original arrest. Lack of proper follow-up, care, support, planning through their reintegration process generally greatly increases the likelihood of youth returning to the problematic behavior that resulted in their justice involved in the first place. Thus, it makes it both the juvenile Excuse me. Thus, it makes sense for both the juvenile and, and for society to put in time, resources, and genuine commitment into the rehabilitation process. Aftercare pro, pro, um, programs for juveniles have been recognized as an essential component 
to the juvenile justice system's effort to reduce recidivism and maintain rehabilitative progress. After use release from detention, a comprehensive aftercare program ideally begins during incarceration and includes providing evaluation, counseling, educa education, therapy, and services to prepare a detain or place a juvenile for successful reintegration into his or her community. It is critical to long-lasting success that juveniles are then likened to organize within their own communities for, con for continued intervention and supervision, lasting well after release from detention. Today, we look forward to learning in a greater detail about the reentry planning and the therapy continuing aftercare programs that DYFJ is providing to young people detained and placed in their custody, as well as how the, clo how the Close to Home initiative has brought about more seamless reentry progress and better aftercare services for youth following detention and, and placement. We believe that these services are essential and are eager to hear how the administration is assuming, ensuring the best continuing of care is provided to justice involved youth, particularly as that population has increased with Raise the Age being implemented last month. Additionally, as today we are joined by a committee of youth services, we look forward to hearing related programs provided by the city, Department of Youth and Community Development. With that being said, I'd like to thank all my staff and all the staff of the City Council for putting this hearing together. And thank you to council members, all of you are here in attendance today. We look forward to hearing testimony from representatives from DYFJ, DYCD, as well as advocates and nonprofit that have signed up to testify. I will now ask kindly that the representatives of the administration please state their names for the record so that the committee council can administer the oath. Felipe Franco. I'm going to ask you to pause just for a second. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, because my co chair does have a statement she'd like to read for the record before you take the oath and tell us all the truthful testimony, all the truthful testimony, all the truthful testimony that you will deliver today. <laughs> all the truthful testimony, you no, I'm only kidding. Good afternoon. I want to again thank you for being here. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose and I'm Chair of the Committee on Youth Services. Today we are conducting an oversight hearing on reentry programs for formerly incarcerated youth. And with the committee on with the committee on juvenile justice, chaired by my esteemed colleague, Council Member King. I would first like to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his commitment to the youth of New York City. I would also like to thank all of the young people, the advocates, program providers, and all those who came to testify today for showing up to this important hearing. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my co-chair, Council Member King, as well as my colleagues who have joined us um, today. And Council Member King already uh, mentioned who they are. As Council Member King discussed in his opening statement, formerly incarcerated youth are one of the most vulnerable populations within the city and across the nation. Aside from traversing, traversing the challenges of being a young person, these youth need to also transition from being incarcerated to being an active and functional member of society. Formerly incarcerated youth undergo a, a sort of dual transition process with the first being transitioning from facility to community, and the second being the transition from adolescence to young adulthood. Think about those challenges. We all remember when we were young, transitioning into adulthood, and how scary and hard this time was. Now think about this in the position of a young person who has been incarcerated and is reentering society. Things can be exponentially tougher for this individual to adequately adapt to regular life. Challenges that formerly incarcerated youth have when re-entering society can include finding employment with a criminal record, health issues including depression, anxiety, behavioral disorders, suicidal ideation, etc., and redefining their roles within their families. Many of these youth have not had to interact with people in a professional or courteous manner, and so they need to assimilate back into this mindset, which often is a daunting task. On top of this, they are dealing with the challenges of becoming an adult and growing up emotionally, hormones, 
peer pressure, and all of the rest. Thus, this is the impetus for our hearing today to identify and analyze the available programs that are out there for these youth who are formerly um, incarcerated or reentering society. Of particular importance to me is what DYCD is offering this population, as well as the intersection of DYCD within the juvenile justice system. We do know that DYCD general takes a more holistic approach to developing a young person or community by offering programs that include family support, literacy services, and workforce development, among others. Essentially, when dealing with those youth that have been incarcerated, these programs can be categorized as aftercare services, of which we look to, at, at which we look to successfully integrate youth into the surrounding communities. Notably, DYCD programs include those that are geared towards youth between the ages of 16 and 24 years old who are out of school and out of work, or OSOW who are generally at a higher risk of incarceration. To serve this population, DYCD offers train and earn, and intern and earn. In addition to these programs, DYCD's Young Adult Literacy Program and the Fatherhood Initiative all provide the programming and services many youth who are formerly incarcerated need. During this hearing, I want to hear what is happening currently within DYCD what programs are being funded as well as being developed to ensure that these youth who are trying to start anew have the necessary resources to do so. I look forward to hearing from those invited to testify and would like to thank my staff at Lena Martin and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, and Michelle Peregrin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, go ahead and... Uh, Felipe Franco, yeah. ACS. Charles Barrios, ACS. Sarah Hemeter, ACS. Tracy Cauldron, DYCD. Daphne Montanez, DYCD. Thanks so much. Do you all uh, firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer honestly to council member questions? Yes. 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 Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair King, Chair Rose, and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice and the Committee on Youth Services. I'm Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice within the Administration for Children's Services. With me today is Chair Barrios, Associate Commissioner for Juvenile Justice Programs and Services, and Sarah Hemeter, Associate Commissioner for Community-Based Alternatives and Close to Home. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss services and supports that Division of Youth and Family Justice, our sister, agency, sister agencies, and our non-for-profit partners provide for youth and their transition back to the home communities from juvenile justice facilities. I commend the City Council as this joint committee hearing exemplifies New York City focus on our national leadership in integrating a positive youth development within our juvenile justice system and practices. The Division of Youth and Family Justice administers a continuum of juvenile justice services, which includes community-based preventive and alternative services for youth and their families, detention services for youth who are arrested and awaiting court resolution, and residential services through close to home for youth who are adjudicated by the family court. Close to home placements include residential care and supervision upon the return to the community on aftercare. Admissions to juvenile detention and close to home have decreased significantly year after year. The average daily population in detention has decreased steadily for many years and declined an additional 29% from 119 in fiscal year 2017 to 85 in fiscal year 2018. Likewise, the number of young people entering close to home placement declined 40% from 227 in fiscal year 2017 to only 136 in fiscal year 2018. These decreases are due in large part to the decline in juvenile crime, the use of evidence-based risk assessment instruments, and the increase in the community-based services to help prevent at-risk youth from ever entering the juvenile justice system. ACS has worked in close collaboration with the Department of Probation 
the mayor's office of criminal justice and the courts to increase the use of alternative to detention programs. And we have worked in partnership with the Department of Probation to develop alternative to placement programs to keep young people who do not need to be in confined, safely in the community with the necessary accountability, services, and support. Raise the Age has now given us the opportunity to extend our entire continuum to older adolescents and to continue building on the tremendous work that has been done to transform the juvenile justice system in New York City. I will now turn to Associate Commissioner Barrios to discuss some of the work done in our detention facilities to help prepare youth for discharge successfully back to the community. Good afternoon. I am Charles Barrios, Associate Commissioner for Juvenile Justice Programs and Services in DYFJ. ACS operates two secure detention facilities, Crossroads and Horizon, and oversees a network of smaller nonprofit provider operated non secure detention residences throughout the city. As Deputy Commissioner Franco noted, the average length of stay for most youth in detention is very short, and the timing of each youth's release is unpredictable and up to the family court or youth part, so DYFJ has deliberately developed a robust menu of services and programming for our young people that is designed not only to enrich their experience and care by helping them build skills and competencies, but to also expose them to interests and opportunities that they may wish to pursue when the court discharges them from ACS custody. All youth in detention receive education, health care, mental health services, recreational activities, and case management for the duration of their stay. An important part of the case manager's job is parent engagement. This includes establishing contact with family, such as parents, guardians, at intake, arranging visits, confirming the use authorized call list, and keeping parents informed about their child's well-being during detention. Case managers assist in facilitating use contact with their attorneys. Case managers also collaborate with close to home permanency planning specialists and Friends of the Island Academy mentors to support the transition planning as well as aftercare efforts. These efforts help prepare both the family and the young person for the use return to the community and his or her family. The New York City Department of Education's District 79 Passages Academy operates a full-time educational program across our entire juvenile justice residential continuum with schools for youth in detention and close to home. We have worked closely with DOE to develop internships, new career certificate programs, and better access to vocational schools. DOE has invested in transition specialists, typically social workers and counselors, who participate in the development of a comprehensive discharge plan prior to release and support youth in their transition back to the right community school. Transition specialists develop transition plans with students, including short-term goals and, most importantly, their immediate next step after leaving Passages Academy. The specialists engage with students and their families about the key decision to either return to their previous school or to transfer to a different school. ACS has opened our detention facilities to a variety of community-based organizations, faith-based groups, and mentors to help connect our youth to supports and networks in the community before they are released from our care. DYFJ and the Department of Youth and Community Development collaborate with an extensive array of partners to provide a range of recreational programs and services to justice-involved youth in our facilities. Through positive activities and strong role models, we hope to develop the skills young people need to redirect their lives in a positive direction when they leave our care. We have vastly expanded our portfolio of programming and services, including our arts and enrichment programs and vocational options to better address the interests of all youth in our system, including the older adolescents. We have also partnered with Friends of the Island Academy to provide programming and reentry services for young people housed at Horizon and Crossroads as well as with the Center for Community Alternatives to provide additional programming for youth at Crossroads. Earlier this year, ACS announced that we've expanded our partnership with Health and Hospitals by building on the success of the work we've been doing with Bellevue Hospital Center and thoughtfully planning and collaborating with Correctional Health Services to help manage contracted health services at Crossroads and Horizon. This ensures that young people in detention continue to receive high quality health care and serves as an important step toward ensuring continuity of care 
for young people throughout the juvenile justice system from detention through placement and aftercare and beyond as needed post-release. I will now turn to my colleague, Associate Commissioner Hemeter, to discuss close to home and the aftercare services, both of which prepare youth to return to their community. Good afternoon. I am Sarah Hemeter, Associate Commissioner for Community-Based Alternatives and Close to Home at ACS. If a family court judge finds that a young person committed an, an offense and at disp disposition finds that the youth needs rehabilitative services, the judge may order the youth to be placed in a residential placement program for a period of time, generally 12 or 18 months. Youth are initially placed in small group home style set residences throughout the city that are run by our nonprofit pro provider partners, referred to as close to home. There, the youth receive approximately six to nine months of intensive and therapeutic programming based on their length of placement as ordered by the family court and their individualized needs before returning to the community on aftercare for the remainder of their placement period. Youth's behavior, level of participation, and personal growth while in placement are key factors in determining their date for their step down to aftercare. In addition, youth participate in community passes and home visits while in residential placement, allowing DYFJ and provider staff to observe and assess the youth's and their family's readiness for reunification. DYFJ understands the importance of empowering families, so Close to Home uses the ACS practice of family team conferencing to plan for youth and, and to ensure that ACS and our providers respond appropriately to youth's behaviors and circumstances. Conference facilitation specialists convene planning and support meetings at all critical program transition points for youth and when youth are not following established expectations. The CFS also ensure that the youth, their families, and all other relevant stakeholders are present at each meeting. Planning for reentry to the community begins on the very first day of a young person's placement in close to home and continues for the entire duration of the youth's residential placement and as they transition to aftercare in the community. Once the family court places a young person in close to home, a DYFJ pla placement and permanency specialist or PPS is assigned, immediately assigned to the youth and maintains regular contact with the youth throughout the entire duration of the placement period. To promote continuity of care, each ACS close to home provider is assigned to a specific youth and also remains with that youth throughout the duration of the youth's placement, including their time on aftercare. The PPS and the close to home provider work together to ensure that the youth's needs are being addressed through appropriate services, both in residential placement and in the community on aftercare, creating a tighter network of supervision and ensuring that youth are held accountable for their actions. After residential placement, most, most young people return to their home communities on aftercare for the remainder of their placement period. The goal of close to home aftercare is to build on the skills youth, youth acquire while in placement and help develop a network of support that will allow them to succeed in the community. On aftercare, youth and their families receive individually determined aftercare services and continue to receive intensive supervision by the provider agency with support from the assigned PPS. We partnered with the Department of Probation to conduct a training for ACS and close to home provider frontline and supervisory staff on best practice community supervision strategies for youth. In addition, youth participate in employment programs in partnership with the New York City Department for Youth and Community Development as well as targeted gang prevention services through the Cure Violence Initiative made possible through funding from the New York City Council. Under the Cure Violence Adaptation for Close to Home, providers connect with youth who have a history of gun possession or gang participation. They engage youth in residential placement through workshops and individualized meetings and support youth as they re-enter the community. Cure Violence staff challenges youth's thinking and serve as positive credible role models, providing youth with an alternative to a violent and or gang involved life. To improve youth outcomes and public safety, Close to Home has worked closely with the Department of Probation to implement the Needs Risk Responsivity Framework, or an RNR framework, a best practice in juvenile justice. RNR uses a validated risk and needs assessment 
to drive case planning and ensure that services are based on the youth's assessed needs. Close to home providers create individually designed service plans for each youth to target behaviors that are likely to result in subsequent offenses. For example, youth with negative peer relationships or who struggle appropriately struggle structure their leisure time may be connected to community-based organizations such as a YMCA where they can participate in constructive youth development activities with positive peers. Similarly, youth with family relationship or parenting, parenting needs may be connected to evidence-based services and youth with education or, or, voc or vocational needs will receive services specifically tailored to support their success in school or work. As a city, it is imperative that we all work to ensure our youth have the tools and supports they need to become successful adults. And DYFJ is committed to supporting youth, families, and communities to achieve this goal. In the summer of 2018, DYFJ announced contract awards for the mentoring and advocacy program, MAP, to four providers in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. MAP is a new community-based program that is designed to support youth by providing them with mentors and advocates with a focus on school engagement, education, and workforce assistance. Services began on November 1st and are available to any youth with justice system involvement, including those who are no longer in the system. In June of 2017, ACS opened a family support center in the South Bronx, which provides a multi-service, one-stop space for youth and their families. I would like to thank Chair King and the members of the Juvenile Justice Committee for visiting the center over the summer and learning about the array of programs and services we offer there. As we discussed during the committee's visit, the Bronx Family Support Center houses, houses DYFJ's Family Assessment Program, the Juvenile Justice Initiative, and the Close to Home Initiative, and enables families with justice system involvement to have many of their service needs met in one centralized location. However, services at the Bronx Family Support Center are not limited to families with justice system involvement and are open to anyone in the community. DYFJ partners with Community Connections for Youth to provide workforce development, parenting groups, housing assistance, and education workshops, and plans to add yoga classes to the public in the future. The space is designed to be shared with the whole community, welcoming everyone, including those whose children are not at risk or court involved. The Bronx location is presently the only family support center in the city and we are planning to open a Queen Center in 2020. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the supports that ACS, our provider partners, and our sister agencies provide for youth and their families in the community. New York City's multi-agency focus on building competencies and supports for youth is commendable and often emulated by other cities and jurisdictions across the state and the nation. As always, we are happy to work with the committee in our continuing efforts to improve the system and services for the city's justice-involved youth, and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Before we go on, I'd like to um, resume the, uh, the vote. Committee on Youth Services, continuation of roll call on intro 376B. Council Member Eugene. I would aye. Council Member Brennan. Aye. Final vote on this item, five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. Um, I, and I am now going to close the um, vote for um, intro 347B. What? I'm sorry, 376B. I'd like to thank the administration. DY City, well, you at the party, you here. What's, what's up? We're here, we're ready. <laughs> you you want to take some questions or you all want to share something with us before we go to I questions? I want to share something first. Huh? Oh, you have testimony? Yes, we do. All right, we all ears. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and Chair King and members of the Committees of Youth Services and Juvenile Justice. I am Tracy Cauldron, Assistant Commissioner for Compass After School Programs at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. And I'm joined by Daphne Montanez, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Connect. 
Thank you for inviting DYCD to testify today on reentry programs for youth. DYCD supports New York City youth and their families by funding a wide range of high quality youth and community development programs. We strive to meet the needs of New York City's youth in our programs, and that includes youth who are or have been involved in the juvenile or criminal justice systems. DYCD currently funds three after-school programs for youth in secure and non-secure detention facilities. Two, two of these operate in the Department of Education, District 79, alternative schools, Bronx Hope and Belmont, and serve 65 youth in non-secure detention and placement, and overseen by the Administration for Children's Services. The third program operates at Crossroads Secure Detention, which serves 60 youth including some who have been transfer transferred from the Horizon facility in the Bronx. These three programs are provided by Center for Community Alternatives and Sheltering Arms. Our programs serve 2,627 youth in physical years 2016 through 2018. The youth served ranged in ages from 11 to 22, although more than half were ages 16 and 17. The programs in District 79 and in secure detention include enrichment activities such as creative and visual arts, STEM, literacy, and leadership development, which teaches youth socially responsible behaviors. The programs also include physical activity and healthy living such as sports, dance, and yoga. They work with expert consultants and subcontractors, including Theater of the Oppressed, the Good Dog Foundation, Better Youth Fitness, and the Community Connections for Youth Mentoring. The programs are offered 12 hours per week over a 36-week school year. Many of these programs have developed methods to connect with participants after their departure. They have shared information about internship opportunities, supported participants through court appearances, and hosted activities promoting career development. Overall, the comprehensive model is intended to help develop life skills in a targeted way to youth involved in the justice system. Daphne Montanez, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Connect, will now discuss DYCD's youth workforce development programs. Good afternoon. DYCD's employment programs help youth between the ages of 14 and 24 gain work experience and further their education. Our programs are designed to consider barriers to employment faced by youth, including involvement in the justice system. The Summer Youth Employment Program, which serves 75,000 youth in 2018, allocates most of its jobs through a lottery system. However, the SYP Vulnerable Youth option provides slots outside the lottery system that are reserved for youth who are justice involved, homeless, or have run away from home, or who are in foster care or ACS preventative programs. We work closely with ACS, the Department of Probation, and the Department of Homeless Services to recruit youth for this option. In summer 2018, SYEP provided jobs to 1,527 justice-involved youth through the Vulnerable Youth Option, and an additional 256 were enrolled through the lottery and identified themselves as having involvement in the justice system. The Intern and Earn Program, formerly known as the Young Adult Internship Program, or YAIP, is a workforce development program targeting young adults between the ages of 16 and 24 who are not working and not in school, and includes a combination of counseling, professional development workshops, and short-term paid internships of up to 300 hours. It operates in three 12-week long cohorts per year. In fiscal years 2016 through 2018, the program served 353 court-involved youth, or about 7% of participants. The Intern and Earn Plus program, now entering its third year, is an initiative specifically for youth who are currently or formerly receiving foster care or juvenile justice services through ACS. This specialized program includes intensive <laughs> case management with smaller caseloads, providing more time to coordinate services with other partners. Each participant's progress is shared with ACS caseworkers and may be used to advocate for closure of that participant's legal case. In the two years the program has operated, it has served 53 youth who were referred from the juvenile justice system. 
they comprise about 25% of the participants in Intern and Earn Plus. The federally funded program Train and Earn, formerly known as the Out of School Youth Program, or OSY, is also aimed at youth between the ages of 16 to 24 who are not in school and not working. The program includes occupational skills training in high demand industry sectors, including healthcare, food service, construction, information technology, and retail, work readiness training and career exploration, high school equivalency preparation and basic skills instruction, employment and college placement assistance, and work experience, including paid and unpaid internships, and on the job training and job shadowing. Participants receive comprehensive supportive services, including case management, assistance with housing, child care, health care, and legal challenges, as well as life skills training, such as financial literacy, health and nutrition awareness, healthy relationships, and parenting skills. The program also includes 12 months of follow-up services after completion. In the last five years, 103 youth disclosed at the point of enrollment that they were considered offenders according to the federal definition for this program, which includes adults and juveniles who have been subject to any stage of the criminal justice system and who require assistance in overcoming barriers to employment resulting from a record of arrest or conviction. Because these participants require additional assistance in entering or re-entering the workforce, DYCD has contracted with Youth Represent an organization that provides both individual legal services and Know Your Rights workshops to train and earn participants. Youth Represent assists participants in researching and correcting the criminal history information in their records so that potential employers do not receive misinformation. They advise participants on employment discrimination as well as other legal areas that can affect a participant's ability to maintain employment, such as eviction and family court matters. Collectively, this representation minimizes the barriers to jobs, education, housing, and family stability that participants may face. Youth Represent also provides technical assistance training to staff at contracted provider organizations. Our main service areas for justice-involved youth are Compass and Workforce Connect, but our other program areas also strive to meet the needs of participant youth who have involvement with the justice system. The Young Adult Literacy Program, or YALP, is aimed at disconnected youth who lack the reading, writing, and or mathematics skills to be ready to enroll in a high school equivalency test preparation program. YALP is designed for youth who are not working and not in school, ages 16 through 24, and who are reading at the fourth through eighth grade level. In addition to basic literacy skills instruction, participants receive comprehensive case management services. Last year, more than 100 participants in YALP identified themselves as court-involved youth. About half of these youth were served through a contract with the Fortune Society, an organization whose mission is to support successful reentry from incarceration and promote alternatives to incarceration through an array of services that include education, employment, substance use treatment, and benefit application assistance. DYCD funds services for runaway and homeless youth that includes comprehensive case management. DYCD providers operate drop-in centers and residential programs. Participants develop individualized service plans that consider their particular needs. Programs also include life skills components to assist participants in transitioning to independence. DYCD's fatherhood program includes an option that is specifically aimed at fathers with prior involvement in the court system. Programs help non-custodial fathers address six core areas, parenting skills development, effective co-parenting, employment and education, child support, child's education and well-being, and visitation and placement. The program served more than 1,000 fathers last year and is successful in helping increase parental engagement and financial responsibility for their children. Last year, 43% of participants in the fatherhood program reported some prior involvement with the court system. In addition to services provided to youth, DYCD engages with other government agencies and relevant stakeholders. DYCD is the home of the Interagency Coordinating Council on Youth, or ICC, an interagency body that includes city agencies that work with young people, including ACS, the New York City Police Department, the New York Public Library, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and many others. 
The ICC hosts a work group on court-involved youth that meets regularly to discuss the particular needs of this population. Last year, the work group published a resource directory entitled Coming Home, Transitioning Back into the Community. It was designed with the input of young people and includes information about resources for youth leaving detention, including housing, practical assistance, legal rights, drug and alcohol treatment, and job searches. The guide has been circulated to youth in the custody of ACS and their parents, in public libraries, and through the Law Department, Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Human Resources Administration. The document is available for download on DYCD's website. Thank you for inviting DYCD to discuss our commitment to serving youth involved in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. We will be happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Levine and Councilmember Mark John I, um, part of the Juvenile Justice Committee. Thank you for joining us today. And, and Councilmember Perkins from Manhattan, Harlem in the house. Uh, I want to say thank you all for coming to today's committee hearing. And we're going to have a conversation here, a few questions. And again, I started saying, taking the oath of truthful testimony. Um, so let's just jump into it. You know, I, I, one thing I will say, I thank you all, because every time y'all testify, it sounds really great. The gravy is good on the potatoes. Love the way it here. It sounds on our ears. But I want to dive into some questions to get an opportunity to find out what's really, what's real. We've been through, we walked down this road before. I say it from a perspective of sitting before a number of people in hearings and asking questions, getting answers, only to find out they weren't truly accurate. So I want to jump in to find out what's really happening. Uh, you know, the white and black sounds good, but I want to know how is all this stuff working? We have young people in the system are relying on us to help them get it right. So while we have programs in place, first thing I'd like to know, um, it'd be nice in the future when we have these hearings that we actually have someone who's experiencing all the programs that you say you're delivering. Because we only truly know the effectiveness if the person is it's working for me. You know, the adults can put this on a piece of paper, but the 16-year-old, 17-year-old sitting in the room trying to understand who's reading at, as your testimony said, you have 14 and 16-year-olds who are reading at third grade level. What do we do with those individuals who are not reading up to par? How do they digest the programs and the materials that you're giving to them if they're not reading at a, at a fourth, uh, 11th grade level and they're six, 17 years old? How does the information, how do those programs actually be effective dealing with that individual? So my first question. Second thing. What other challenges are you having in delivering these, pro these programs? Third question is, how are the people who are receiving these programs telling you whether or not it's working for them or it's not working for them? The fourth question I have to you is that when you're reaching out to young people who are interact getting ready to go back into society, they're going back into the same communities that they came out of, you said in your testimony that they will be going back and probably the gang is still there, the bad elements are still there, the story has not changed from the time they left and they came back into, into the system. What kind of outreach are we engaged with the people that you know that they're going to go back and back into having communications with or enduring with? How are we interacting with the outside world that they have to go back in before they go into the outside world? I'm going to stop right there because I think that's enough for right now. Anyone? You have four questions. Let me see if I got them. The first one has to do with literacy and how young people can be prepared to manage when they're reading at the lower grade level. The second one has to be the challenges of delivering services for this population. The third one, how we plan for return to the community, and I didn't get the fourth one. The fourth one is how are you engaged with the community before they go back into the community? Because if Malik has to go back in the same environment where gangs are, okay. do we go into the streets to find out what's going on in the streets. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually being on the ground, not just being inside the system, because the system has got to extend into the community. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin with the fourth one, because that's uh, what we do in aftercare. I think it's important to keep in mind that New York City is unique nationally, that actually young people are actually close to home. So while most other jurisdictions have to actually kind of prepare a young person to return home three hours away, like if you are in Chicago, you will go to one of the facilities three hours away from the city. Uh, in New York City, as Sarah Hemeter mentioned, young people actually are earning the right to get home 
and they actually do that through a series of family uh, team conferencing, and actually by the ability of being able to go home for home visits, where they actually have to come back and demonstrate that they actually are setting up a new network of peer relationships and places to go to that are positive as you were speaking. One of the things that actually we have in New York City that is actually unique to is that because of the city council, we got funding to develop an adaptation of QR violence. So we actually have credible messengers that work with young people in detention and in close to home, helping them navigate before they get home how to deal with the negative influence of gang affiliation and gun violence. So those two things are actually something really unique to us in New York City, where young people can actually be practicing the behavior before they're finally discharged and then getting home. And I think it's to your point, we need to make sure that it's not just about what we do in the facility, it's how we prepare in the network of support when they get home back to their community. Okay, that's answer four, and then we'll go through one, two, and three now. Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, the folks from DYCD could answer better around literacy and services than I can. So as I mentioned in the testimony, uh, we administer the Young Adult Literacy Program uh, targeting young people 16 to 24 years of age with low literacy and uh, numeracy skills between the fourth and eighth grade uh, reading level. Additionally, through our federally uh, funded program, our train and earn program, we also provide young people with basic skills instruction um, and high school equivalency preparation there as well. And throughout all of our workforce development programs, uh, there's a strong element of case management and supportive services that are provided to young people. So if additional supports are needed, either through literacy or to help to stabilize them, whether it be an issue with housing, childcare, or even mental health services, our providers are equipped to uh, do those assessments and work closely with our participants in connecting them to the services that they need the most. Okay, so let me, I'm, I'm gonna throw a question back at all of you again. When it comes to literacy, and you've said a lot, and the only thing I wanna know is, you can answer this, how many young people come through you who have literacy problems and how have we been, what kind of success rate have we had? Because we can offer a whole host of things, but if my literacy level doesn't encourage my confidence because I don't still don't know how to read, all these other programs mean absolutely nothing to me. I'm still, in a, I'm still in a land of frustration. So I need to know what kind of success rate that we're having with all these programs, especially with our young people who have literacy problems. Absolutely, so through the Young Adult Literacy Program in fiscal year uh, 18, um, we uh, served, uh, over 500 young people and 75% of the students enrolled um, uh, saw some uh, demonstrated educational gains. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, 75% of enrolled students were post-tested and 55% of those post-tested -test demonstrated an educational gain of at least one grade level at both reading and math. I'm 16 and I got one grade level, so if I'm in third grade, I moved up to fourth grade. Okay, am, am, I, am, I, am I assessing that right? What you did, am I, is, that my, is my conclusion right, what you said? That? So um, what I would say is that for the youth within the program, there's a, a varied um, array of uh, literacy levels, whether fourth grade through uh, sixth grade, some may make great gains and reach uh, higher grade levels, maybe up to the ninth grade level, while those on the fourth grade uh, side may take a bit more time to, to uh, increase grade levels. So did I, did I hear you say 75%? 75% of enrolled uh, students were post-tested uh, in the program, and 55% of those post-tested demonstrated an educational gain of at least one grade level. What happens to those who didn't even meet the 55? Because in school, 55 is still failing. So what does that mean for the others who are below 55 right. percent? So I, I must say that YLP is not uh, within my personal portfolio. I'd be happy to get back to you with more specifics around those outcomes. Okay, I, I'd appreciate that answer because at the end of the day, sometimes we do a whole lot of stuff that's up here, but if you don't take care of the basic foundation, none of this really matters. So if a young person can't read, they can't understand, ego, frustration, all kind of other emotions kick in because they don't understand what's going on in the environment. And when they don't understand, then that's when their behaviors kick in. 
So sometimes we have a tendency as, and I, I come from a perspective of being a youth developer for 20 years, knowing that a system sometimes messes the system because the system is protecting the system and as opposed to really hitting the core of what the problem is with the child. So that's why I'm asking these questions. I need to know if the system's on track to save lives or the system is just saying we're doing some work. Um, I'm gonna stop right there. I'm gonna pass it over to my chair and anybody else who has any questions right now to continue this conversation. I wanna thank you for your um, testimony today. Um, and I'm interested in the um, interagency cooperation um, and what relationship um, exists between DYCD and DYFJ. And um, does DYCD interact directly with DYFJ and or the juvenile justice system? Um, and at what level is this relationship? What, what level is this uh, um, correspondence happening? So um, we uh, partner uh, with uh, with uh, all of the services, all the agencies in the city that serve youth through the ICC, um, and in the workforce uh, development portfolio, we work closely uh, with our partners on uh, several of our programs. Uh, one of them is the SYAP Vulnerable Youth uh, Option, which serves young people who are either justice involved, runaway and homeless, uh, foster care, in foster care, or receiving ACS preventative services. We work closely with our partners at ACS, Department of Probation, and the Department of Homeless Services on uh, recruiting young people uh, for this option. This is outside of the lottery, and uh, so any young person who is job ready um, can be served through this vulnerable youth option. Additionally, we work with ACS on the Intern and Earn Plus program, which serves young people who are receiving foster care uh, services or in the juvenile justice service. Uh, is that a direct referral or self-identify, self, um, or do they self-identify? So we do receive referrals from our partnering agency. Our providers are also on the ground working with, in their local communities uh, with partnering organizations to recruit young people for these options. And, and how many young people do you have you serve through this direct pipeline from direct referral from DYFJ? So overall in the uh, Summer Youth Employment Program, the Vulnerable Youth Program, we served 1,527 youth uh, who were identified as being justice involved. And And that's through direct referral, not um, young people who self-identified. So that, that is actually, that includes both referrals from our agency partners and provider rec uh, recruited uh, participants as well. Um, and I will have to get back to you with the precise number from uh, ACS and, and the agencies. Mr. Oh. Chair, Chairwoman, to your point, I mean, every, every six months before the summer, both agencies work closely together to do two things. Ensure that young people who are in detention can get a summer job. And I think we have a unique model where actually young people who are in Horizons or Crossroads can actually start working summer youth employment while at the facility. And if by any chance they get discharged, they continue their job in the community. And in close to home, we ensure that 100% of all the youth in, who are in aftercare are connected to summer youth employment or summer school. And we do that every summer for the last five years. Um, a council member uh, needs to ask a question. Uh, I'm just gonna make a statement for the record because I have to leave. Forgive me, I apologize. I just gotta manage something else. Um, but I'm just gonna ask, because there was a song by James Brown, talking loud and saying nothing. I don't want us to be in a hearing where we're talking loud and not saying anything that's gonna help the lives of our young people. And I want us to be real clear, whatever this mission is, if the answers don't really help a young person, let's figure out how do we get the real answers and a real prog a little program that does help. If we have programs that aren't delivering, we gotta, we gotta really address those programs, not just to say we're doing work from nine to five, but they're not helping. You know, we, we come in with stats or we don't have stats, but the young people in these facilities are still relying on us to get them right. 
So we got 14 and 15 year olds who are still trying to figure out lives. If the, if the counselors are there and need help to help them or the kids need additional stuff, I'm asking you all from time to time, if you haven't done it because I haven't heard the answer yet, find out from the young people in the system what do they also need to help them get to a place where they can understand what we're trying to give them. Because if we can't push through that, all our work is in, it's a futile effort. So I'm asking us, please, please let's do all we can to be true and not ever come into a room and saying loud, talking loud and not saying anything that's going to help our young people. And, and, and I say that with all respect. And with that, I just want to thank, we're joining, we've been joined by Councilman INS Barron from Brooklyn to the committee hearing. Thank you again. Thank you. I'll pass back over to Chairman Warren Rose. Thank you. Um, does, uh, is, does the same relationship um, and referral method apply to train and earn and intern and earn? Program? I'm sorry. So for the Intern and Earn Plus program, uh, this is a collaboration um, in particular with our partners at ACS and uh, we work closely with our agency partners and the providers uh, who support the program to gather those referrals. For Train and Earn, uh, providers uh, work on the ground and our agency partners can refer young people to that uh, opportunity as well. Um, how many formerly incarcerated young people um, receive um, the pro programming? Um, well, let me change that. Do you track and count the number of youth, of formerly incarcerated youth, that receive programming through DYCD? And how do you determine that status? How do you know that they are formerly incarcerated or court involved young people? Um, so it can happen in a few ways. We can receive that information from our referring agencies at the point of referral. Uh, in our intern and earn and train and earn programs, our young people may choose to disclose that as a barrier at the time of enrollment uh, as well. Um, but we serve all youth regardless uh, of status and so um, in those particular programs, we do not uh, ma mandate that they provide us uh, with that information. Um, however, in our train and earn program, for instance, in 2000, uh, in fis fiscal year 2018, 23 young people identified themselves as being court involved. Um, do you track these young people? Do you keep numbers? Do you? Um tabulate this uh, data? Absolutely. So across the uh, portfolio of all of the programs I mentioned in my testimony, uh, in fiscal year 18, we served 1,919 young people were identified as being court or juvenile justice involved. Um, and since uh, SYEP is a lottery system, um, how are you able to make your, is there a finite number that you are serving or, or aim to serve for court involved young people? So uh, through the lottery options, uh, the program is open to all young people. In uh, this past summer, 256 young people uh, were selected through the lottery who had, had identified on their application that they were justice involved. However, the majority of the young people who are justice involved in the program are served through the vulnerable youth option. And that option uh, exists outside of the lottery process. And uh, it, it's an option that we have grown over the number of years. Uh, we've gone from 1,000 slots in 2014 to serving over 3,100 this past summer. And uh, a great, uh, a credit is made towards the relationship we have with our partnering agencies and our SYEP vulnerable youth providers. They sit on a work group uh, to help uh, every year to improve the program, increase the number of referrals, and uh, this is an option uh, that we hope to grow uh, throughout the coming years. So you're saying that um, a young person can opt into um, a specific category as um, court involved youth if or they are formerly court involved, incarcerated? They will have an opportunity to participate in SYEP through the vulnerable youth option, yes. And how do they know this? How is this information given, uh, dis distributed, or dispersed? So, uh, 
uh, again, through referrals from our partnering agencies. Our providers are also on the ground working with uh, their community partners and spreading the word. Uh, DYCD uh, shares information on our programs through our Youth Connect and social media platforms. Um, we also have uh, the ICC, uh, as I mentioned, uh, put out the uh, report, The Coming Home, uh, uh, which is a resource uh, for young people who are leaving detention, and uh, that's made available to young people uh, at ACS and through a number of our partnering agencies as well. Um, does DOE um, do any type of education in terms of I could be caught involved but still going return to my uh, my my high school of uh, absolutely my, in my neighborhood? Absolutely. How are they informed somehow through that process? So yes, DOE is also a partnering agency with us. They share information uh, on our programs. They are also part of our uh, ICC uh, coordinating committee as well. Um, and the ICC, mm -hmm. um, all of the city agencies are involved in that. And it, it sort of resulted in a, a report that, um, or a document yes. that's distributed to young people. Mm -hmm. um, and young people had input into this, the development of this document. They did. Um, where is this document that young people, how, how can a young person access this, this document? So uh, this resource uh, directory is shared uh, with our partnering agencies. It's also given uh, to ACS and distributed to young people who are in detention and their families. So they have this, so uh, they have access to information, everything from education to employment programs um, and other supportive services. Uh, the guide is also available on our website as well. It's also distributed at public libraries. I, I just need to um, sort of digress, but not truly. Um, we had a hearing about the hotline uh, the bullying hotline, the resources for young people. Um, and we were told that DYCD and DOE made this um, information known and that most people, most young people knew of it. We took a tour of Covenant House a week ago and there were actually three um, young people there who needed the resources and clearly could have benefited by the hotline. Um, and they had no knowledge of it. And um, so it led to them being outside, being homeless much longer than was actually necessary. And, um, and I don't want this to be the same situation where we have a document that's, um, that we say is available but um, the knowledge for people to know that it's available or that it exists is, you know, siloed somewhere. So can you I, reassure me that, you know, this document, I know it exists, but how are we making sure that the population that needs this document, you know, actually has access and, and knowledge that it exists. Absolutely. Um, so we'll definitely take that feedback uh, under consideration and uh, we'll ensure that we uh, have this document and resource available uh, more readily. However, it is available on our website. It is available through a number of our sister agencies and in public libraries. And additionally, our programs at DYCD are placed intentionally in high need communities. Our provider network, uh, they do wonderful work in ensuring that they recruit and share information about our programs and our services for all those that can benefit from them. Now I'm the, I'm the youth chair and I'm always in youth centers and I have a very good relationship with my cure of violence. Um, uh, my cure violence workers, um, I've never seen this document. 
and I'm, I'm in situations where I've even been at the library. I'm in situations where if this document existed, um, I should have come across it. So I, I want you to, um, there needs to be something more done about you know, the existence of these resources that are there to help our young people and they're not actually getting it. I, I just, I'm gonna ask one more question because I know the rest of the committee has questions and then I'll come back. Um, have there been any modifications to discharge planning services since raise the age? And if so, what were those modifications? Modifications to kids that are being discharged and released from detention and or placement? Is that the question, Chair? Um, since raise the age, what modifications have been made to um, their discharge plans, their, their, their planning? At one time, you were only making discharge plans for young people, you know, with the, up to 18. Now we're looking at people up to 24. What, have there been any changes in the discharge plans for since we've you know, adopt it, raise the age. Right. So with respect to uh, kids that are in detention, um, we've certainly taken age into account, and now we're looking at, particularly in terms of educational options and vocational options, what are the young people's interests and abilities, and what are some of the resources that we can expose them to while they're in detention, and then identify opportunities for them to continue with those resources in the community. So that's an adjustment we've made with respect to raise the age. Um, in addition, we have expanded the use of our safety plans, otherwise known as behavioral support plans, um, by looking at um, what the need is with respect to the older population, um, and particularly um, with young people um, who experience um, emotional dysregulation or in need of mental health services. Make sure that we identify those resources in the community and working with their families to ensure that we connect them to places where there's continuity of care as they're discharged from the facilities. Um, for example, um, with Train and Earn and Intern and Earn, um, these programs are for a certain age category. Um, have programs like these, the age been extended to include the older, um, young people, and, um, and if so, I, I think a stipend for like a 12-week program wouldn't really be um, an, appropriate, um, an appropriate re-entry program for me um, if I'm a 21-year-old person. So are we taking into consideration you know, those. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, keep in mind that actually until October 1st of 2018, most of the young, the young people who were living actually at our detention facilities were living at the age of 16 or younger. So you're right. I mean, now we're actually going to have young people living at the age of 16, 17, and maybe up to 18. So as um, Commissioner Barrios mentioned, we have been working with the Department of Education to do a couple of things. First of all, we, for the first time, established equivalency programs inside, inside our detention facilities. Those were not available before October. So now most of our young people are actually on a high school, middle school track, but now we have a group of young people who are actually going for their equivalency inside both facilities. We actually, as the Commission uh, Barrios mentioned before, we began offering certificate programs inside the facility. Actually yesterday I met the first nine young people who got their OSHA certificate. They're very proud of that. And I think those are the kind of trajectories that we're working with the Department of Education under District 79 to move young people not just to the traditional community schools, but to some of the co-op tech kind of programs that are gonna be beneficial for them. So it's kind of new. We began on October 1st, only a month ago, but we actually already have the first set of youth with certificates. And I think those are the kind of young people who are poised to benefit from the programs that were presented by the YDCD before. Um, when you do case management um, and someone's re-entering, do you have a list of employers that are willing to hire these young people? Yeah, I think we should talk a little bit uh, um, 
about our summer. Last summer actually was particularly unique because in partnership with BYCD. I'm, to, I'm, I'm outside the SYEP. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. but I, I, what we did this summer, which was unique, is that we began placing young people in, within small community-based uh, small businesses. And Charles, you can talk about this for the better. But actually, many of those young people who actually work at a barber shop or a mechanic shop in the community, many of them actually kept an employment post the summer. Uh, we actually have a whole PowerPoint that we can share with you of how this new approach of being intentionally thinking about what the young people want to do and how to connect them to small businesses is actually beginning to pay off. But as we get older youth, we want to do more of that. I, I promise this is the last one. Um, tracking. Um, how long do you then track a young person who has um, uh, gone through your case management and are now back into the community. How long do you keep track of them? How long do you provide um, them with resources and support? Yeah, I think uh, Commissioner Hemeter can talk about aftercare. Our placements are intentionally divided between residential care and aftercare. And actually young people still report and are accountable to us for up to five or six months. I'm talking about aftercare. Yes. So, um, as mentioned in the testimony, um, you, the youth are placed with us for about 12 to 18 months. Um, and so during that first period of portion of time, they are in a residential facility where they are living day to day, um, getting this every, all their services within the residential facility, and then they are transitioned into the aftercare portion where they are living at home. Um, but they are still being monitored and supervised by both the ACS um, placement and permanency specialist and the provider. Um, and so we are tracking what they're doing and how they're doing um, throughout the, the life of the, the placement from day one when they enter the facility all the way through until the end of their placement, which includes that aftercare portion. Is that answering the question? That um, I'm talking about separate and aside from like a probationary period. I'm, I'm talking about how long you actually provide them with, with support services. Right. And track so, them. so legally, ACS can only monitor during that placement period, um, but we again are trying to connect them with the services that they can continue going forward. So if they are connected to a YMCA, that they will continue going there. That they, if they are connected to um, a, a vocational program, that they are continuing to go there. Um, so after that placement period, the goal is that they are connected so that we are no longer having to supervise and monitor them. Okay, so we're not just putting them out, throwing them out the door and saying, we connected you to the YMCA. No. And I mean, the whole purpose of, of, of Close to Home is to have that p period of time while they are on aftercare, which is generally five to seven months, maybe a little longer, so that there is their time in the community um, where we are working with them, where they are continuing the skill building that they learned while they are in the residential facilities, and then connecting them to those services within their own community that can con continue beyond the time they are with us. Council Member Perkins. Question. So they continue, they continue beyond, and what is their relationship with you as they are moving beyond? Hopefully successfully. <laughs> yes, hopefully successfully, that, that they won't need us to monitor them anymore. Um, I, but legally, again, they are placed with us, the court places them with us for a specific period of time, and after that, we have no legal authority to supervise them anymore. So again, what we're trying to do is connect them to those services um, within their community that can continue beyond our supervision of the youth. Okay, so you're out of the picture, so to speak, yes. once that connection is made. Right. And, and what is, how do you get feedback in terms of how well they're doing uh, following the separation? Right, so we have um, a, a continuum of conferences that happen throughout the life of the case. There are six that are done automatically during the placement period where we bring together the, the parent or the guardian, wherever the youth is gonna be living, the youth 
any service providers that are involved, the placement provider and our ACS staff. Um, so on a regular basis, we're bringing those folks together um, to have a conference to see what are the needs, are the needs being met, are the services in place, do we need to change anything? Are there other things that are happening in the youth's life that we need to figure out and, and address and put those services in place? In addition to that, if there are anything, any issues that kind of pop up during the life of the case, if, if something's not going right, then the provider can ask for a conference as well and we'll try to bring everyone together to, to try to head off any problems and figure out um, what additional services need to be put in place at that point. So again, when you say the life of the case, when does the case, from your point of view, end in terms of the relationship with you? Right. The agency. So, so legally it ends at the end of the disposition. So if a judge places a youth with us for 12 months, it's at the end of that 12 months. And then they're on their own, and presumably uh, somewhat able to, to navigate the world. Well, we try to, con again, try to connect them with those services that are ongoing, but we legally are no longer supervising that, that youth. And so, uh, so how do we know, how do you know, upon the uh, separation, or the, the transition, so to speak, um, what this, you know, how the, how the case is going, getting along, how yeah. they're getting along. Again, it's through those conferencing. Uh, you know, we have a conference, I believe it's 30 days. I could be wrong on that. I have to check our schedule um, prior to the end of the case, um, just to make sure that everything's put in place. Um, you know, we can always, if things are not going well at all, we can always go back into court and ask for an extension of placement. Um, so that if a youth needs a longer period of time that we can then, but it has to be court ordered for us uh, to do that. And it has to be court ordered, and, and what triggers the court order? Uh, some uh, problem that has uh, Usually that gotten is to the attention of the yes, authorities? So not necessarily, sorry. Or the family, <laughs> I don't I just want to understand, how does it get to the? Yeah. So it could be that, it could be, you know, the youth is in contact with the police again, but it could be, you know, we're again monitoring uh, throughout, the, throughout the, the placement period. If when you say in contact, you mean arrested or being charged with something? Well, that could happen, okay. obviously, yes. Um, if that does happen, then a conference is immediately held and we are figuring out what to do. So it's, but not, that's quite not, like the, it's not quite like going to the PAL. But, the, but no, Contact. but that's, yes, that's not it always what triggers um, an extension of placement. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Now, now the resource directory, uh, that's available online, you say? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you brought some copies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I just want to, one more question. Um, uh, in regards to SYEP, um, we've gotten some information from some advocates that uh, formerly incarcerated young people were not allowed to participate in the program. Are you aware of that? And, you know, could you discuss that? And what, you know, is there something in the process that would preclude um, court-involved or formerly incarcerated young people from participating in SYEP? Uh, no, actually, um, as I mentioned, the vulnerable youth option um, specifically uh, serves young people who have been involved in the juvenile justice system, and we're actually looking to grow and expand that option, um, hopefully bringing online additional providers and uh, those that have experience working with that population. So you, there's nothing that you know of that would have um, triggered uh, this particular advocate's um, group from I not being able to process this young person? Uh, a, a person with, you it know. It may be a part uh, particular instance, in which case I, I would need to get more uh, 
information about that particular instance, um, but in terms of uh, the goals of SYEP and particularly vulnerable youth, we're looking to actually expand that option for all of the vulnerable populations that fall under that, under, under that option. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for testifying today. Um, I just want to encourage you all um, through the ICC, through your individual agencies, that um, you, you're putting in the work, but if no one is aware of the end product, it's, um, it's really for naught. And um, it's really distressing to me as the youth chair to go places to talk to advocate groups and, um, and they're not aware of the resources that we have available or that, are, that have been developed. Um, I think something that needs to be talked about at the ICC is how you're going to make these things much more um, available. People you know, should know about it. Um, New York City spends money on marketing campaigns for things that they think are important. I happen to think that this is very important that young people um, know where and how to get the resources that are available. So I, I really would like each of you to take it back to your, your agencies and, um, and figure this out, and figure this out. Because it's something that I'm going to continue to, to reference um, until I stop you know, hearing that from, from young people in New York City. So I want to thank you all, and um, we're going to call the next group. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. All right. Um, Giselle Castro from Exalt Youth. Oh. Where did Council Member Barron had a question? Okay. Jeffrey um, Guida, Guida, or Gaia. Um, getting out and staying out. Nancy Ginsburg, Legal Aid Society. Alyssa Perone, Advocates for Children, and Balfour Thompson, Youth Represent. As you um, come forward, we're gonna um, we're gonna ask you to introduce yourself and your organization, and you can start your testimony. I'm um, I I hate to do this, but we have to um, vacate this room uh, by uh, four o'clock. So. Um, uh, keep your testimony succinct, and we'll keep our questions likewise. So you can begin, identify yourself and your agency. Good afternoon, Giselle Castro, Executive Director at Exalt Youth. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jeffrey Golia, Associate Executive Director of Getting Out and Staying Out, GOSO. Good afternoon, Legal Fellow at Youth Represent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Nancy Ginsburg, Legal Aid. Thank you. Good afternoon, Alyssa Perone, Staff Attorney at the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Deborah Rose and Council Members. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about reentry programs here in New York City and the importance about it. My name is Giselle Castro, and I'm the executive director at Exalt Youth, a nonprofit that serves young people ages 15 to 19 in New York City. And we offer paid internships for them. Um, and we have a proprietary curriculum, and we develop individualized plans for every young person that comes in through our doors. I want to begin by thanking the chair, Deborah Rose, for your advocacy on behalf of young people and hosting this hearing today. Thank you so much. 
And I would also like to thank the Division of Youth and Family Justice and also the Department of Youth and Community and Developing Development and other partnering agencies who are here with us this afternoon for their investment in servicing our young people. I want to briefly give an overview of our organization and the work that we have already done with young people who have been in the system. We're designed to address three particular areas, which is navigating young people away from the juvenile justice system, ensuring that they make improvements academically and educationally, and more, and more importantly, employment as they enter their adulthood. We are founded in 2006, however, we are modeled um, from cases, an alternative to incarceration program in 1997. It's part of their career exploratory program and we launched in 2006 our organization. We were incubated and tested by the Blue Ridge Foundation, the Annie E. Casey and John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And I have over 20 years working with young people, particularly who have been incarcerated, impacted by the system in prison and detention facilities. Um, and I also have with me this afternoon Brian Lewis, our deputy director, who is overseeing our programming as we scale the organization to triple the number of young people who we serve, that we're going to serve. I want to briefly, and I'm taking into consideration the time, the impact that we have made over the years, I mean over decades at this point. Over 65% of our young people, they face serious charges, and we have been able to do you know, really well in terms of advocacy and ensuring that 75% of our young people who have open court cases, their cases are reduced. But more importantly, and what is encouraging for this organization is that less than 5% of our young people are reconvicted of a crime, while 95% of them are entering, are progressing academically. Um, I'm going to close out with this. We have over 400 referrals a year. We partner throughout New York City with uh, Legal Aid Society, with the DA's office, with judges, uh, with ACS, with many um, you know, organizations, the Department of Probation, and we have been working together to ensure that our young people who are exiting either prison or are facing potential incarceration are given an opportunity to succeed. So once again, thank you, Chair, for this opportunity. Thank you, Chair Rose and members of the committee. My name is Jeffrey Golia. I'm the Associate Executive Director of Getting Out and Staying Out, also known as GOSO. Founded in 2003, GOSO is a comprehensive reentry program serving 16 to 24 year old young men who've been involved in the criminal justice system. We work with participants from all five boroughs. Many we meet during the four days a week we provide services in the jails on Rikers Island. Others join our community program located in East Harlem through referrals from probation and parole judges and district attorneys, defense attorneys, alternative to incarceration programs, and other participants. We also do get some referrals from council members as well. Uh, additionally, we correspond with hundreds of participants currently incarcerated in upstate and federal prisons. GOSO works with more than 2,300 young people a year from all five boroughs in New York City, and our recidivism rate is really low, 15% compared to a much higher local and federal average. The vast majority of our clients uh, live well below the poverty line and lack a support system, and many suffer from diagnosable mental health disorders. GOSO believe that reentry starts the day a person is incarcerated, and we, support, and we support our incarcerated and detained participants by encouraging them to go to school and start planning for a productive life uh, when they return home. For the last 15 years, GOSO social workers have worked with thousands of young men in the jails on Rikers Island, as well as juvenile facilities and upstate facilities. We currently meet regularly with close to 250 participants in the sentenced and unsentenced buildings on Rikers Island to discuss educational and employment goals and how to avoid re-involvement in the criminal justice system. GOSO is also unique in that it provides robust reentry training for youth sentenced to upstate facilities and continues to keep in contact with this population once they are in custody upstate. GOSO provides aftercare and reentry services that are essential to ensure that clients have support to transition to their communities and their schools. GOSO's community program is tailored to address educational, employment, and emotional well being concerns, while also providing individual attention to each participant's individual needs and goals. All participants are linked up with a licensed social worker, either an LMSW or an LCSW, who are equipped to provide psychotherapy as well as reentry planning. 
Many of these LMSWs and LCSWs have also worked in the jails on Rikers Island, providing services before providing these services in the community. Every week without fail, we run a comprehensive job readiness curriculum that allows participants to be eligible for a number of additional programs designed to help them achieve personal and professional success. We have an on-site task program run in collaboration with the Department of Education. Participant, participation has grown each year, and this year we've enrolled 32 participants in our school. We also provide support to our participants who are in college and trade school, including monthly Metro cards as well as books. GOSO also provides many vocational trainings to prepare our participants for careers they seek to earn. Is that my time or? Fair enough, all right. Well, thank you so much. Okay, well, I guess I'll just say that much of our work remains behind bars and it is essential that the city continue to work with organizations like GOSO, which have provided a successful reentry programming model in Rikers as well as in Horizons. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of you. Um, I am a legal fellow from Youth Represent, and Youth Represent is a legal organization that works with justice-involved youth ages 16 to 24 um, who, ha who are going through justice involvement or have had justice involvement in the past and are dealing with legal issues as a result. Um, in particular, um, in terms of housing, in terms of employment, we both, everybody all the conversation that we have, we understand that those are two barriers that a lot of young people have to overcome in order to successfully re-enter into society. Um, we represent young people in NYCHA hearings, so I imagine that everyone is familiar with um, permanent exclusion, uh, wh where a young person may have committed a crime or may have been convicted of committed a crime, or even something as simple as an arrest, and now a family has a decision to make in terms of either staying in the house, um, uh, staying in the house and removing the young person from the house or um, th all the whole family just leaving uh, as a whole. You, um, youth represent, represents young people in these hearings and I like to say that we have a fair amount of success um, in keeping young people in their homes and making sure that they're able to re-enter, successfully re-enter into society. Um, on the employment front, just recently, um, as, as recently as last week, um, we had a client who is a college student um, she's looking for a job just for living expenses, um, and she applied for a job, got the job as a resident aide at a shelter, um, got a full-time position. After she got the full-time position, she was told that she can't, after the background check, she was told that she couldn't work for the organization. Youth Represent stepped in. Um, we represented her and found out that the organization was flagrantly violent, the Fair Chance Act, but now she's able to work. Um, there's countless stories like that. Um, a lot of time when we talk about reentry, we forget to talk about like the legal barriers that young people have to go through. Youth represent represents young people on, on that front. And if there's something that we're not able to do, we have partner organizations that we work with um, in order to like have a, hol have a holistic approach. Um, our approach is we do workshops in settlement houses, schools, jails, pretty much letting the young people know of our services. Um, and once they know that the services that we provide, they come up to us, we have intakes. Um, and if we're able to help them, we, we do so from whatever position they're in when we meet them until uh, afterwards. Um, just on a personal note, uh, like I understand the problems that plague ju justice involved people. Um, I'm from the community that these young people are from. Um, and I really and truly do um, see the value in having legal reentry services so that young people, so that young people can successfully reenter into society. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Ginsburg. I oversee the adolescent practice for the criminal trial practice of the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I would like to recognize our tremendous partnership with many of the ATIs throughout the city. My testimony today is focused primarily on um, actual re-entry. Um, to your question earlier, Member Rose, um, two of the three have newly been made available through Raise the Age for adolescents who were moved from Rikers Island to Horizon. Um, 
Friends of Island Academy Youth Reentry Network um, was created in August of 2016. New York City invested in a historic initiative to provide neighborhood-based pre- and post-release support for adolescents leaving Rikers custody and now has been made available for those youth at Horizon. Friends of Island staff work with young people ages 16 to 21. Um, and the Friends of Island staff moved with the 16 and 17 year olds as they went to Horizon. Staff starts working with the youth for discharge upon entry to detention through a combination of work with the young person, outreach to his or her family, attorney and community support system, a plan for discharge is developed. Friends of Island staff help connect young people to community-based services and to develop plans to support release. Upon release, teams of Friends Youth Advocates work with the youth in their neighborhoods, connecting them to community and public resources, helping with scheduling, accompanying them to appointments, activities and court dates, facilitating adjustment to school, reconnections with family, local resources and community life. The relationships between Friends of Island staff and our clients have provided necessary support where some of them have little upon release. Even where our clients have a supportive parent or guardian, additional support for the most vulnerable young people is always welcome, particularly for working parents or those managing competing needs of their other children. Many of our clients look to the support provided by Friends of Island staff as critical to their re-entry success. We encourage the council to learn more about this program and to ensure that funding continues. Another service that transferred with the 16 and 17 year olds moving from Rikers Island to the Horizon Juvenile Center is mental health discharge planning. As a result of a class action lawsuit filed in the 1990s, Brad H., the city has been required to provide discharge planning services to individuals with mental health diagnoses held in the custody of the Department of Corrections since 2003. Now young people with identified mental health services in Horizon are entitled to comprehensive discharge planning. As part of implementation planning for Raise the Age, Bellevue Hospital Center, just give me one more minute please, which provides quality mental health services for our clients in Horizon, hired a social worker specifically to engage in discharge planning for young people with identified mental health diagnoses. While it is too early to assess these services, we are optimistic that the addition of discharge planning will provide much needed connections to ongoing mental health services in the community. I have addressed the education transition services in my written testimony and I ask you to refer to them. Um, there is actually a website that, a link that you can, um, that you can access through the testimony um, which will give you more information about many of the youth that the DOE, District 79 transition counselors, um, have provided to our clients that have resulted in tremendous results in reentry to school and vocational programs in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making that source known. Hi, uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Alyssa Perone. I'm a staff attorney on the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children, and I provide education advocacy and legal representation to students who are either involved or at risk of being involved with the juvenile and criminal justice systems. So my testimony today focuses on the educational uh, reentry programming needs of this population. I've submitted longer written testimony, um, but school engagement is crucial to successful reentry programming and sadly disengagement from school is um, unsurprising for this population. Research indicates that when students' behavioral and academic needs are unmet uh, stu and students face school suspension, they're more likely to be held back, to drop out, to not complete school, and ultimately to get rearrested again, which feeds right into the school to prison pipeline. Um, one of the benefits of close to home has been the increase of youth engagement in school while in juvenile placement and detention. Um, students at Passages are earning more academic credits than ever before and those are going right onto their transcripts. Um, this is particularly notable since the number of youth enrolled in school um, in the New York City uh, juvenile justice system over the past five years has markedly decreased, but those who remain have greater needs. As we discussed before, um, 
63.2% of students enrolled in passages have a disability um, from the 2016-2017 school year, and more than 90% of students at passages read below grade level. Uh, despite the efforts of the Department of Education Transition Specialists assisting youth um, <coughs> re-entering the community from passages in East River, court-involved youth are often inadequately supported emotionally and academically within the under-resourced schools they return to. Um, when compared with the 70% of students in New York City's general population who receive a high school diploma, we've heard informally that the rates for students involved in the juvenile justice system is in the single digits. Um, so this, in our opinion, should be seen as nothing short of a crisis. We are frequently contacted by programs who work with court-involved youth who are struggling with the education aspect of reentry, and we see that see firsthand that these students are often pushed out of school or drop out um, and get rearrested. We, um, we also believe that policing in schools um, can be especially traumatic and cause a huge barrier for these students who are returning. Um, and these students often have unaddressed mental health needs or needs that are no longer addressed once they return to the community, even if they are being addressed at passages. Um, indeed, uh, as many as 45% of New York City schools don't even have one social worker on staff. So given the importance of these factors, sorry, I'll just wrap up, we respectfully call on city council committees on juvenile justice, youth services, education, and mental health to hold a joint hearing to examine the educational outcomes of students upon reentry um, and to look at ways that we can help them reach those educational goals. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for um, the work that you're doing. Um, and um, I want to acknowledge that uh, Council Member Deutsch was here. Um, and, and I have a few questions, uh, and I have an, um, an apology to make. Uh, I didn't turn this watch back, so I thought it was 4 o'clock. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to apologize to you. <laughs> but um, so. Um, I'd like to know what you think um, detention facilities should be doing to prepare young people for reintegration into their communities. Um, what do you think is effective and what isn't? And, you know, um, uh, it, some of you elucidated some of the challenges that young people have reentering. So um, are there other programs that the city should create or provide? Anyone could take a stab at it or well, anyone? I would say aside from the provision of mental health services, diagnosing and, um, and providing, I think, uh, evidence-based psychotherapy, one big issue that our youngest participants face is when they come home, and this was mentioned before, they're coming back to the communities uh, where they um, had been either arrested or detained. Um, and that environment is not necessarily uh, different, and there's not specific interventions happening. Now, Getting Out and Staying Out has a cure violence team called SAVE, Stand Against Violence East Harlem. The work that we can do with SAVE to provide the aftercare necessary for these adolescents um, is very transformative in the community. Um, our SAVE team is comprised of credible messengers who can provide mentoring as well as linkages to professional services, and I think that that's that's really important. Um, our SAVE team has also worked in the jails on Rikers Island, and I know that we're looking to have them work in Horizon and Crossroads for exactly these reasons. Um, involvement with gangs and crews is very high in these, um, in these uh, facilities. Um, we know because many of the young people who are transferred to these facilities, we had signed up on Rikers Island when they were still locking up adolescents there. So I think that aside from the robust reentry services that a program like GOSO can provide, um, continuing to invest and expand the cure violence model, I think, is a fantastic idea for addressing those issues. Thanks. Have you, um, I'll, I'll let you answer, um, have you been impacted by Raise the Age? Has it changed your programming or have you expanded programming? It is changing it. Um, I wouldn't say that the change has happened immediately. Um, we are, um, by virtue of of, of young people moving to um, borough-based facilities like Horizon and Crossroads. Um, 
we, d we will have to staff up and have more folks to be able to provide the services, not just re -entry, uh, recruitment services, but also reentry planning services. And that also means being liaisons to other programs, whether it's our Cure Violence team or others to provide other wraparound services. So we are preparing for that. And I think that that's something, so, so we've been anticipating this change for a while and we've just basically um, been looking to um, find in our budget ways for us to not just increase programming, but also the staff to provide that programming. So I think that the, the assistance of the city council as well as other funders has been very helpful in that and we're just looking to expand because um, we need to reach more young people. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I, I would like to respond to the two um, aspects in terms of um, are we prepared for the Raise the Age? Uh, we, in May of 2017, we launched a visibility study to assess whether the org our organization could grow in scale and on January, our board of directors, they endorsed it. We're launching a scaling campaign to raise additional dollars. We're one of the few organizations that we are funded by private foundations and individuals. We have very little, like one person of our budget is government and none of city council. Um, and we did this knowing and understanding that our young people, they need a lot of you know, support and intervention. One of the areas that you know, our youth need you know, additional support is academically and educationally. You know, we created our curriculum to inspire young people and to be, have them love the idea of learning once more. And we have connected with Advocates for Children you know, so many times and identifying better or more suitable places for them to um, you know, go and to study. Um, in the last hearing, uh, I think this was like a few months ago, one of our young women, she testified, she was referred to us by ACS, and she has graduated, she works, she interned with Janine Gray, and um, she's now in college. We also have, you know, it's pretty outstanding, you know, the type of work and the results that we have. It takes effort, and I think that, you know, one of the areas that we're seeing um, that Raise the Age is creating is real opportunity to, you know, to work together. Um, one last thing that I want to add, we have one of our young girls who graduated seven years ago. She was referred to us by the Department of Probation, given three opportunities. Um, the many challenges that she presented are not, you know, unfamiliar to us. Um, long story short, she graduated this year from Yeshiva University with her graduate studies degree in social work. This didn't happen in isolation, you know, so I really do stress in, you know, ensuring that our young people are given quality education. I do believe and I have seen over and over again when our young people are challenged, but in um, well and meaningful, thoughtful places, they, you know, they thrive. Um, so I would say education is an area for us to really focus on. Are you satisfied with the level of uh, cooperation from um, city agencies that are providing, you know, services? So we have worked with city agencies, you know, with the Department of Probation. We have referrals from ACS. We have referrals. Uh, so we have we have worked with them in terms of referral process. We're now building stronger relationships in terms of deeper partnership. As, as I said before, we've never formally enter any contracts with any city agencies. And now we are. Um, you know, one of the um, healthy aspects about our organization, because it has been tested, now we have more, you know, to contribute to the field. And it is in one you know, specific discipline, so we're not saying that we do it all, but we do, you know, have really strong collaborations with, you know, other nonprofits and other organizations. I would say that there's a, there's a big, what I have seen in my assessment is that there is a concerted effort, and I think that people are sensing the urgency to do well. However, you know, the system has so many challenges in itself, right? And we were given a very short, um, you know, turnaround time to implement such a huge initiative. And I think that those are the inherent challenges that um, people are responding. They literally are rising up to the challenge to the occasion. But I think that one of the areas that we will all stress is that it is funding and it is ensuring that we could bring in, you know, the right people and also retain people who have been in the field, you know, for quite some time, um, you know, to ensure that we are successful in this huge, huge initiative. May I add one thing too? Um, one of the most successful aspects of GOSO's programming has been our employment development program, GOSO Works. Uh, we utilize funding from the Works Progress program, which is a city program, um, not just to subsidize um, paid internships, but what we call internships to employment. Uh, we have 70 employer partners around the city in which we place young people 
um, we start by subsidizing their wages and then they are hired by those sites and we have a 69% success rate when it comes to those placements. And again, it's part of that wraparound provision of services we have, but that funding is crucial and essential um, for some of our older participants, the 19, 20, 21 year olds, but we're also starting to see that appropriate employment placement for adolescents coming out of Horizons Crossroads and other non-secure detention, um, or those who are just referred to us, um, can also be great in terms of just building up those job skills. And again, not so much towards a career per se, but definitely to build those foundational skills it can also enhance their educational experience as well. So we've worked very hard um, hiring staff and then finding age appropriate job placements so that those young people can kind of develop that, um, not just those skills, but that ego strength necessary for them to be successful. So the Works Progress Program has been fantastic in that. That's great. Yeah, good, after good afternoon. I just want to address the first question that you said. Sure. Um, on, a, on a super simple note, I think that um, young people need to be a more part of the conversation um, when we're talking about youth reentry services. Like a lot of the time, um, we're making a lot of decisions for young people, and young people aren't in the room. Um, youth represent one of the programs that we have is a school justice project where as I said before, we're able to go into the schools and give workshops and pretty much it's a, it works because we're able to tell them about our services, but they're also able to tell us about problems that they're dealing with. And we're not limited to one borough, so we operate in the five boroughs uh, in the city. And which, what I've found is that the issues in the Bronx might be different from the issues in Brooklyn, you know? Like, and so when we have one, uh, one size fits all issue, there might be gang activity in one pocket more so than it would be in another pocket and you if we introduced youth into the conversation as opposed to like making decisions for them uh, they probably we probably have a better outcome in terms of how we can how they can better re-enter into society thank you that's a, um that's an excellent point um you must have tried to work on staten island huh <laughs> I, I actually we, our office actually has been on staten island um, and the issues are different from the issues Very. in brooklyn and other boroughs i know Thank you. Um, I will say that some of the greatest barriers that we see to reentry to our young people, and some of this is being amplified by Raise the Age, are housing and family services. Um, almost all of the young people who are system involved have extremely long trauma histories. Uh, their families also have that same experience. They need a lot of service, many of them need a lot of service for extended periods of time and the current model is for short periods of time because the programs that provide those services are considered evidence-based and anything beyond that period of time is beyond the evidence-based program model. Um, and some of the, our kids and their families go in and out of crisis. So while they may successfully complete a program and they may be fine for a few months or a year, they may lapse into a new problem and it's very hard for them to access services at that point. Um, and so I think what, you know, in our dream world, we would like to see uh, young adolescent services be transformed into a young adult model so that young people can access age appropriate services and don't have to go into adult services, into adult shelters at the age of 18, which are really not appropriate settings for them, no. where they can get more supportive services, both for them and their families, where they can access age appropriate mental health services, where they can access age appropriate academic services, vocational services, and they can be surrounded by age appropriate groups. Um, and so ideally we would love to see a system that goes through 24 or maybe 26 <laughs> um, so that this can really happen. And I think what, what you've heard a lot about connecting people to the community and trying to get them out of the system players is one of the most important things that really the city needs to be looking at is how to, they may not necessarily be reintegrated into exactly the family unit that they left, mm -hmm. 
at the point they were incarcerated, but they do need to be reintegrated into some support system that they can see ongoing until they can develop the skills to live independently. And that really needs to be a web of housing, academic, vocational, mental health to support all of their needs. I mean, I'm sure anyone who has their own children or who has family members who have children know that they don't stop calling after they <laughs> become no. young adults. <laughs> they always call and kids really do need a lot of help as they make that transformation into young adulthood um, and just having that support system so that they can do that um, and they don't fall into crisis because when there is no, when there is no web for them to to catch them when they go into crisis, they tend to just re-enter the system. Um, so we would, we would encourage the council to dream big on this um, and to really look at um, maybe a system reorganization on this. Thank you, I think that's a very important point, you know, that there should be some seamless, you know, transition um, with a, a safety net, that's um, sort of what I was trying to get at when I asked them about how long do they follow these young people or track them. Um, we know that, you know, there are pitfalls all along the way. You, you might have traversed that, you know, that problem, but, you know, there's another one waiting. Um, so um, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion, especially with raise the age, we need to have some sort of seamless, you know, um, transition so that there's a safety net for them um, until they, they can, you know, be uh, appropriately on their own. Um, so thank you. Did you want to? No? Okay. Um, oh, wait, wait, council, um, uh, I, I do have, um, do any of you do any studies or analysis of recidivism um, and or readmission rates, you know, that could gauge the effectiveness of aftercare programs? I can speak to our recidivism rate and the, uh, what, what we actually are, are looking forward to a program evaluation to really determine what specific interventions we provide that lead to our low recidivism rate. Um, because uh, as I said, our recidivism rate is approximately 15%. Um, that's compared to a national average of, I believe the latest statistic was 67% um, for, uh, for this age group. Um, we tend to think our model, which is comprehensive, focuses on employment, education, and emotional well-being with a real strong emphasis on just holistic individualized care mm -hmm. provided by licensed social workers. Um, we tend to feel that that is uh, part and parcel of that model um, that is effective. Uh, we are looking to see, um, again, what specific interventions lead, lead to that because, again, that's really based on sort of um, a tradition of success but not, again, knowing exactly where that is. That would, that would require um, a, uh, a fairly expensive um, 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 evaluation. W with that said, I think that um, the council and others could support reentry programs in seeking to determine what are the evidence-based practices that lead to not just reduced recidivism, um, what we call surviving, but also thriving, right? Uh, young people who are achieving educational success, employment success, um, as well as just avoiding reinvolvement in the criminal justice system. So we really look at it as recidivism is great, and for the first 10 or so years of our organization, we really hung our hat on our recidivism, right? But then it was really looking at our own program and saying, how can we help these young men radically reshape their lives in ways in which they feel satisfied um, um, by, uh, by what they're doing, um, that the relationships they're building are good too. So I think that there's a lot to look at and evaluate, um, but as it relates to recidivism, I really feel like it's, 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 that, it's that therapeutic foundation for the services, um, along with, again, employment and education. Hi, Thank can you. I, can I respond to that uh -huh. as well? Um, Thank you. As I said earlier, we conducted a visibility study to assess, you know, what's the impact that we're going to have in addition to serving more young people, you know, thinking through about our alumni. We have young people who have graduated four or five years out still engaged with us. And the main aspect, you know, that 
for, and the reason why they return is for their education and for employment. And I think that and what we have seen and what our assessments begin to show is that our youth, what they're looking for is like access for um, you know, opportunities and it is employment and it is, um, it's money. You know, the bottom line is that they're looking for money and resources um, and we have been able to partner with CUNY for young people who are interested and ready to go off to college. You know, what we're seeing with our you know, group of young people is that education does really matter for them because that's a way for them. And we, we talk a lot about you know, racial equity in our organization and what does that mean? What does um, you know, living in New York City and gentrification, what does that impact on them? You know, we begin to pay attention to the real challenges that they have. And our kids, you know, we place them in, you know, internships like the Innocence Project and they're interning with attorneys. You know, there's always this dichotomy and this conflict of, you know, where are they? And the amount of challenges that they have to face in their family to move away and out of the system. And what we're seeing, and once again, and I agree with Nancy, um, it's, you know, we have to think more long term because even our young people who are getting out of the system, they carry the burden of taking care of their family. Well, this is um, economy. This is about money. This is about finances. This is not, this is about paying the rent. This is about so much that is so rooted in our country. Um, and, you know, we, I'm not too sure we could really solve a lot, but we, uh, what we're seeing is that a lot of it has to do with, you know, finances and opportunities for preparing them for not just the world of work, but for a better future. Yeah, <clears throat> that's why I was saying internship programs versus um, an SYEP versus, you know, a job mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, career development so that it's not just a job, a low paying job, but there is the ability to, to advance and, and you have meaningful employment. So um, thank you. Um, Council Member Perkins, you had a question? Oh, okay, okay. Um, if there was one thing that you could tell the administration um, that you want or you need changed, what would it be so that I can go back and give them a message? Is there anything? Well, I, th I, I want you to know I've heard you about, you know, educational opportunities and jobs. Um, I heard you. I just wanted to know if there was anything else you think that um, would make the transition um, a, a bit easier for young people or something that you'd like the administration to know. Um, that's a great question. I, I would say that, you know, in terms of what administration should know, it's what administration is doing, is assessing, you know, what organizations, you know, are out there, um, you know, I would say at this point with the courage, you know, to ensure that we are successful. And in order for us to do that, you know, we partner, and I partner with Friends of the Island Academy, we partner with everyone. I think that, you know, at this point, what we need is to ensure that we're sustained and sustainability in running a nonprofit organization. I mean, I wear the other hat, I'm always fundraising. Mm -hmm. And that is a big challenge, you know, to ensure that um, the staff that we have, that they are retained, um, to ensure that our young people, they're given quality experiences. And, you know, in the same way that we're, provi you know, we're providing equity for our young people, um, you know, I have this ongoing, you know, thought that unfortunately a lot of the nonprofits, you know, we're also fighting the cycle of poverty. And in order for us to make great, great strides, you know, we really have to do like an analysis of, you know, how is it that the um, city agencies and the nonprofits are really collaborating and there is real collaboration, but at the core, there is a lot of questions in terms of finances. Thank you. I'd say a recognition that there needs to be a, a therapeutic underpinning, um, particularly in the context of juvenile justice and juvenile facilities, and that includes supporting reentry programs to be in those facilities to provide clean transitions for these young people into the community and into a web of support that can really lead them to be successful. Um, again, it's not just about wiping our hands and saying, well, they're out of here, they're out of the system, or they've aged out, or whatever the case may be, but the idea of really being able to utilize the folks on the ground who are able to provide the most effective services in the facilities and then following them out into the community. Thank you. Anything from the youth? Uh, <laughs> um, 
just kind of I echo the sentiments about funding, um, but also while we talk about reentry, like just so it doesn't get lost in this the discussion, like legal reentry is is super important as well, you know. So like employment. Um, housing and all these other things, like the collateral consequences of like leaving um, jail and or prison, any type of incarceration and coming back into society, there's always legal barriers that have to, like, or legal hurdles that have to be overcome. And a lot of the time I think, you know, we talk about different programs that aren't necessarily tied to like the legal issues that young people may have when they leave, like how I was talking about in terms of fair chance act violation, um, and just so that that doesn't get lost in the discussion. Thank you. Well, since you asked the question, <laughs> you're actually going to talk to the administration. I, I am. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me, yeah. but <laughs> I'm going to talk to them. Well, our, our, one of our greatest frustrations is how quick the administration is to write off young people who are charged with the most serious crimes, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they, there are many reasons why young people become involved um, in criminal activity um, of, of that nature. And those kids often have had the toughest lives, need the most support, their families need the most support. They usually all as a unit need a tremendous amount of mental health support and treatment. And this has been, I think, I'm glad I'm sitting next to Advocates for Children because I feel like we're a broken record in this building on this issue of the failure to provide deep end mental health supports for the most affected young people, both in the schools and in the system. And until we commit as a society to help those young people um, and their families, we um, will not really address the reasons and why, um, why young people end up in these situations. And we have seen in situations where kids, young, where kids and young people have been charged with very serious crimes and have been provided with appropriate mental health services, we have seen them be able to turn themselves around to grow into thriving young adults um, so it is possible, but it takes, it takes a tremendous amount of support and commitment um, to, to make that happen, which is not to say that those young people should not be held responsible for their acts and their behavior, but because many of them are suffering under extreme mental distress at the time they commit those crimes, if you don't address the, that mental um, distress, then you just warehouse them in, in detention or in jail and they, their re-entry is assured not to be successful. And that is a public safety issue that really needs to be considered. And the only way that there is any hope of addressing that is to provide significant supports for those young people and their families. Thank you, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what has been said here is is our feeling as well, and particularly just with that education piece, um, when students are in school and not receiving those critical and crucial mental health services that they need, and schools turn to school discipline or to their school safety agents who really often, and I've attached Advocates for Children's Data Brief on Children in Crisis, often um, those school safety agents are engaging in roles that are, are beyond law enforcement and typically, uh, you know, I think it's something like over 40% really could have just been and, and do end up just being um, referred back for school discipline. When you do those things, instead of providing those supports in school and where we're seeing so many schools without mental health services whatsoever, these students really do just enter that school to prison pipeline loop and they're not getting those services in school and so um, they're they're getting suspended, they're dropping out, uh, they're not graduating, the, the graduation rates are abysmal. And I think that collaboration, which is why we were calling for you know, a joint um, committee hearing to talk about these issues could really be beneficial to addressing um, those significant needs. I wanna thank you all. Um, 
your testimony has been very elucidating. And I really am going to go back and talk to the administration. So um, with that, I'd like to say at, not by my watch, but it's, it's 3.30. Oh, it's 3.23. And this meeting, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.